Hello and uh, good afternoon from the Roland DG offices here. Uh, my name is Joe and I'm here with Suzanne from Coral. Hopefully you guys can all hear me okay. Um, if one of you wouldn't mind just popping into the chat box uh, that, that, that you can hear my voice okay, that would be great. There we go, brilliant, perfect, <clears throat> thank you. Um, as the webinars are recorded live, uh, there might be a little bit of lag between um, sort of what the computer's doing and, and us talking. So uh, you might need to adjust uh, the volume on your end as well. I can also turn it up our end, but it sounds like you guys can all hear, so that's great. Um, so as I said, my name is Joe Riggs. I look after the Roland Academy here, uh, and I'm join, joined by Suzanne Smith. Can I say hello, Suzanne? Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. So we're going to be, or well, Suzanne's going to be taking you through uh, uh, a bunch of neat tricks and time-saving tips and things from, from Coral Draw. Um, just a few notes about the, the webinar as well. So this will be recorded uh, just for your reference. Um, and uh, we are working on a section on our website which will host all of these webinars down the line. So you should be able to access it again. But at the moment, uh, that's not active just yet. Um, in a minute, I'm going to pass over the controls to Suzanne. She's going to share um the screen of of her version of coral so she could start talking through the presentation uh, you can use the chat box which it looks like most of you have found already to ask any questions things throughout the webinar we will try and keep an eye on that so if things pop up we can pause and answer questions as they come in but sometimes we do miss them um <clears throat> it's quite hard keeping an eye on both so just uh, just be patient and then at the end we'll have a little bit of extra time as well where we can sort of go back and address anything that that we might have missed. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, get, get comfortable with the controls that you have at your, at your end. And what we'll do is we'll just jump over to uh, screen sharing a moment. Just bear with us. So hopefully now you should be able to see uh, the uh, a sort of a coral image with the coral um, home screen popping up, uh, and I shall pass over control a second to to see the hand. So hello everybody, thank you again for joining us, and thanks to Joe and the Roman Academy for inviting us today. So today is going to be a whistle stop tour of tips and tricks that I hope you're going to find useful. And I hope, above all, that it's going to help you speed up your workflow when working with CorelDRAW. So I'm going to start off by pressing F9 on my keyboard to put CorelDRAW into slideshow mode or full screen mode. So before we start, I just want to mention quickly the, the, the different versions of CorelDRAW that are out there on the market. Because if you are thinking of upgrading, it's, it, it, upgrading, it's important to get the correct version. Now, what I'm going to be showing you today is the Core Draw Graphics Suite 2018, and this is just the full retail version. And the, the retail version has all the professional tools and setting and filters you need if you're working with Core Draw professionally. If you are a small business and you need more than one license, a very um, a cheap option to get three lies is the small business edition. So that's the that's the retail version of Coral Draw, but it's three licenses, and it's cheaper than buying three single licenses. And the other version that we have is the home and student version, which I wouldn't advise buying if you want to use this professionally because it's a not for commercial use, and it's also missing a lot of the tools and features that you do need if you're intending to use this for professional print jobs. So it was quite difficult for me to, to decide on what I was going to show you today because there's such a lot I could show you. But I've narrowed it down to features that I get asked about time and time again when I go to trade shows. So we're going to be covering those, but also some new tools in this version of CorelDRAW that you might not yet be familiar with. Now you can upgrade from any version of CorelDRAW. So if you're not uh, working with 2018, team yet, you might see some features that you find interesting. So we're going to be looking at saving time by streamlining the user interface. We're going to look at working with templates, and we're going to look in a bit more in-depth at 
converting images into vector graphics because this question comes up time and time again. If you do artwork yourself, there's been lots of enhancements regarding the nodes. And a brand new tool that we have is the block shadow tool, especially interesting if you're doing vinyl cut. Now, the knife tool is a tool that most people don't know all the things that this is more like a Swiss army knife, really. The knife tool can do a lot more than most people think it can do. There's a brand new symmetry tool, which is fantastic for creating symmetrical designs and symmetrical objects. Other competitive software um, offers a symmetry tool, but you have to pay to get it. And this is built into CorelDRAW. Um, brand new in this version as well are the perspective and envelope effects. In all versions of CorelDRAW uh, below 2018, you could only apply perspective and envelopes to vector objects in this version. You can apply these effects to bitmaps, vectors, and text objects, which is fantastic if you're doing mock-ups uh, to show to customers. I also have a selection of CorelDRAW extensions to show you. Again, these extensions in the past, uh, you had to buy them. They're now free and included in the suite. We'll be looking at the find and replace feature because often um, people have quite a complex design or they've got a multi-page document, perhaps a catalog, and they've been asked to change a specific color or a specific line width. And you want to be able to do this really quickly. Um, moving on to the font manager. Now, most people working in airline business, they've got hundreds, if not thousands of fonts. Everyone's guilty of collecting fonts. With a font manager, you can now use fonts in CorelDRAW, whether they've been installed or not. So you can actually use a font within CorelDRAW designs, even if the font hasn't been installed. And more important, you can actually sort your fonts into categories, into types of fonts, which makes it a lot faster if you're working on a project and not quite sure how to find the font that you're looking for. Uh, very important, soft proofing and setting up color management, because what you see on the screen, you want exactly that to be coming out of your printer. Variable data printing, now called includes the Roland system palette and the um, VersaWorks color palettes. They're both built into CorelDRAW. And we're going to be look, having a quick sidestep into VersaWorks Jewel so that we can see how we can set up a print job that uses variable data. So another topic that comes up a lot, how can I knock the background out of images? I need to remove the background. And we'll be looking at that in CorelDRAW and also in Coral Photo Paint. And finally, if you're not a CorelDRAW user, but you're perhaps you're an Adobe user and you're thinking of switching, but I'm not sure if it's too difficult to make the switch. I've got a couple of tips for you as well. So I'm just going to go out of full screen mode and let's get started. Now, when you first open up CorelDRAW, if you've installed a fresh version of CorelDRAW, the first things you, you really need to do is A, to set up color management and B, to tweak your user interface so that you can work fast and efficiently with it. So we'll have a look at the color management first. So we're going up to tools, color management, and we're going to start with the default settings. So here in Europe, they were set up by default to general purpose Europe. But if you happen to be using CorelDRAW for many years now, perhaps you've been using CorelDRAW for, I don't know, 10 years or, or longer, or if your customers are sending you files that come from CorelDRAW X4 or older, then it's very important to be aware of these two settings here. Now, there's a proper cutoff point between CorelDRAW X4 and X5. With CorelDRAW X5, the color management or the color, color management engine was built from the ground up. So the color management in CorelDRAW X5 and upwards is completely different to that of X4 and below. So if, if a customer sends you an old file, or if you've got old files yourself and you think, wow, these colors are all wrong. This is where you probably need to look to start off with. So you can simulate color management of CorelDRAW X4, or you can turn it off altogether. And this is where you're going to go, first of all, to set up your correct RGB, CMYK, and grayscale profiles. 
You can also ask to be warned if you're bringing in documents that contain images that have already got embedded color profiles. This is where you can make a decision how you want these profiles to be handled. Now, every program is like an iceberg. Most of us use about the top 10% of features and tools. And there are many, many more tools in a program that you probably never, never use or never see. But something that's really annoying is having to go through different, different toolboxes looking for just the tool that you need or scrolling down menus just to find that one tool that you've forgotten really where that tool is. Now, we have here three buttons. These are called the Quick Customize button. We have one on the toolbox, one on the property bar, and one where the Docker panels are. So if I click on this Quick Customize button here, I can see every tool in the toolbox, and more importantly, I can turn these tools off if I never ever need them. So if you just scroll through this toolbar, turn off everything you don't need, and what this will do is it will just completely slim down that toolbox for you. So it'll be a lot quicker and a lot easier to find the tools that, you're, that you most frequently use. You can reset the toolbar at any time. If you choose a particular tool, you can see that this tool um, basically generates a custom property bar. And again, here you've got a quick customize button. So if there are any settings here that you're never going to use, just turn them off and just slim down the property bar. And finally, we've got a quick customize button here where the docking panels are. So you can decide which panels you want to have permanently open. So each time you start call a draw, the dockers will be waiting for you. Now, the dockers themselves, you've got every docker has, um, just go to my object manager here. So the dockers themselves have got icons at the top to make it easier for you to work with them. So you can show the object properties. So if you've got bitmaps here or objects, if you click on this, it will allow you to see the properties. And you can also collapse this to show just a layer view if you're using multi-page documents. Now, if you're anything like me, I have to work with a computer about eight hours a day, if not longer. So sometimes that can get be quite strenuous on the eye. So what I also like to do is I like to go into my options under appearance. And I like to change the background. So for the, for the webinar, I've left the interface to be quite light because that works a bit better, better in the video recording. But when I'm at home, I actually prefer to work with a darker background. Now, not only can you change the background, Let's say you're doing a design for a customer. Let's say it's a poster or a banner. And the customer's told you this banner is going to go into this room. This room's got a blue wall or whatever. You can actually change the desktop color. Let's just pick a color here. And it's just going to change that desktop color. So while you're doing your design work, you can get some idea of what that design is going to look like on a specific desktop color. Now, if you're working with multiple monitors, let's say you've got, I work with a laptop at the moment, but I've got a monitor standing next to me. Depending on, what, on which screen you want to run your color draw, you can actually scale the size of the interface. So if you're working on a really high res monitor and you find the icons are too small, you can't see them properly, you can just scale that up. So I'm just going to reset that now. Now, because we're talking about tips and tricks, I just want to show you a docker here that most people ignore completely, and that's the hints docker. Now, the hints docker, which for some reason is not opening up, is always the way when, you, when you're doing a webinar. Now, the hints docker normally show you information. Let's just close this and open it again. There we go. So we've got our hints docker here. Normally, when you choose a tool, so I think I've got some lag here, it will not only show you how to use that tool, but it will also lead you to videos. So it'll take you onto videos regarding that tool. Let's just click on the text tool again. So I'm just going to scroll down here. So the hints hint docker will take me to the help file. It will give me a list of videos. So front manager, 
text effects, and it will also take me to written tutorials. So it's well worth it if you're using a tool that you're unfamiliar with, just checking out this hint docker, um, just to see what's on offer there in the way of tutorials and videos. Now, I often do multi-page documents. This, this webinar, for example, is 27 pages. You might, in the course of your, of your work, uh, perhaps do newsletters or catalogues or something like that. And there's a view that's really quite practical, and that's called the page sort of view. Now, things that I use a lot, I tend to give keyboard shortcuts to, because even going up to the top, scrolling down the menu, that's something I don't want to have to do regularly. So things I like to do a lot, I normally give keyboard shortcuts to, and I'll show you how to do those in a second. So let's go into page sort of view. Now, the page sort of view is useful, especially if you're doing multi-page documents, for giving you an overall view of your document. Not only that, you can swap the order around, you can right click, you can rename the pages, you can duplicate and do pages, but it just gives you a nice view of your document and lets you swap things around within the document. So I'm going to use my keyboard shortcut again, Alt P to go back. So how do we create keyboard shortcuts? Well, we go up to tools and we go down to customization. So we go down to our commands. Now the commands are sorted by menu, so you can look for commands under specific menus, or you can go show all items. Once there, you can click on the binoculars and you can look for a specific command. For example, the zoom commands don't have keyboard shortcuts, but I like to zoom in and out quickly using my keyboard. So if I click on find next, it's just going to go through these different keyboard shortcuts. And as you can see, zoom to height. All I need to do is type in a keyboard shortcut here. I've already done that here. And once you've typed it in, you click on assign and it assigns the keyboard shortcut to that command for you. Another couple of keyboard shortcuts that I've actually assigned, which I find really useful, is um, going into wireframe mode. So I'm just going to press W on my keyboard and that takes me into wireframe mode, which I often find useful for getting a skeletal view of my design. If you, especially if you've got a complex design with things layered on top of each other, a wireframe view is going to let you drill down into that design and look at the different objects in there. And I'm just going to go back into enhanced view here. And finally, um, something that makes working with CorelDRAW really fast is if you create your own toolbar. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you use perhaps, perhaps you've got a top six to 10 tools that you use all the time. Now, the way you create your own toolbar is, is you press the Control and Alt key. So I'm just going to do that now. Control Alt, and you just drag out a command to the desktop. Now, this doesn't only work with tools, it also works with menus. So I'm just going to pop that over here and just open up a new here. And another tool that I like to use a lot is the boundary tool. So again, holding down Control Alt, I'm just going to drag out a tool over here. And as we go along, Let's do one more here, Smart Fill Tool. Drag it along. So as we go along, I'm just going to put any tools that I find useful onto this toolbar. In order to keep this toolbar, I need to save it. I need to give it a name. So we're going back to Customization. And now we're going to Command Bars. And this is my toolbar here. So I'm just going to click on this. And I'm just going to call this Roland. I'm going to say OK. Now, it normally takes about 30 seconds for the name of this toolbar to update, but we'll just leave it there and update as we're going along. So I'm just going to check if there are any questions. I can't see any questions so far, so I'm just going to continue. Now, I know sometimes our customers contacting me saying, I've got this file I use it all the time. It's one of my basic files that I use as a template, and now I've corrupted it because I've been opening and closing this file for about five years now. What can I do? Um, if you 
if you have files that you use as templates, then what I would suggest you do is open that file and then save it as a template. That way you've got a template that you can use every day, but you've also got your original file untouched, saved away in an archive somewhere in case you ever need it. So we're going to start off by creating a template. So I'm just going to select these two t-shirts here. And I'm going to go up to file, save as template. And of course, I just want to save the selected objects only. And let's call this Berlin t-shirt. Um, you can, if you've got, if you, also, if you've got other machines that, you, that are running older versions of CoreDraw, you can choose to run a different version or save a template in a different version of CoreDraw. So let's go save. Now this opens up the template properties window. So let's give our template a name. And let's go through here. So that's single sided, hasn't got any folds. Um, categories. Now, the templates that you've got 380 templates built into it, but as you can see here, it's more printed business cards, catalog certificates. So I'm just going to go to other and I'm just going to call this um, uh, t shirts. And the industry is, let's call this fashion. Now I can also put designer notes in here. I can put, for example, the font that I use. I can put the um, color palette that I used. I can put the t-shirt material I'm intending to use. I can just build up, I can put anything in the designer notes that I want. So I'm just gonna say, okay. So if we want to use our templates at a later date, we go back up to file, we go to new from template, and my template is now here under my templates. So this is where I'm going to find all the templates that I use. And over here is where you'll see, if we have proper designer notes, you'd see the designer notes in there. Okay. Um, while, we're while we're talking about new documents and templates, presuming that you've already set up your color management, when you open up a new document, now I've got a 27 page document. If I'm doing a catalog, for example, and I know I'm gonna need a certain amount of pages. I can just pop the number of pages in here from the word go. Now a Coral Draw document can have up to 999 pages. And the largest page size that you can have is 150 feet. So that's what, you're, that's what you're working with. So I can pop in here, if I know I'm doing a catalog, I can pop that in here. I can give it a name and I can also save that as a new document template. So I could save that as a catalog template. Other than that, if you go to preset destination, depending on what you choose here, you're going to get the color palette, which you can see here on the right, open up. So if I, do, if I choose an RGB document or a web document, it's going to automatically open up my RGB palette for me. So now we've talked about, so we've set up our document, we've set up our workspace. Now what I forgot to mention is once you've tweaked your toolboxes and your property part and your dockers, of course, and you can see my toolbar has now changed name. It's now called Roland. Let's pop that up here. So I want to save this workspace now. Now, if you've created workspaces in the past, you haven't lost them because you can import workspaces from CoreDraw x6 and up so x6 x7 x8 2017 218 you can 2018 you can use these all these workspaces you can bring those in now so what you do is once you set up your workspace you go to window workspace and you export it so i want to save everything here so it's going to save my my keyboard shortcuts and all my settings export give it a name and then save it. Um, and of course, if you do different types of jobs, if you're doing printing jobs or illustrating jobs, whatever, you can create different workspaces for the different tasks ahead. And it saves you reinvent the wheel each time. So one of the favorite topics of Coral users is converting bitmaps into vectors. 
Now, normally, when you select a bitmap, you're normally going to go up to trace bitmap, you're going to go down to on outline trace, and you're going to look for something. So that will take me a couple of seconds to decide on what I want to do. But how about if I could just do that in one click or using a quick keyboard shortcut? That is what quick trace is for. So we're going up to tools and options and we're going down to power trace. So under power trace, you can decide what happens when you trace. So you can use the last settings that you used or you can say, every time I click on quick trace, I want you to create clip art. So you can choose clip art. You can also choose if you want the tracing to be fast or if you want better quality, I normally like to stay somewhere around the middle. And I'm just gonna say, okay. Now, what I also did is before I said, okay, I went to my commands here and I gave my quick trace a keyboard shortcut. Okay, so I'm just gonna say, okay, to that. So all I have to do now is if you don't want to use a keyboard shortcut, you can just do quick trace, but I've actually given it a keyboard shortcut. So all I'm gonna do is go Alt Q and it's just gonna go through and trace that for me. So I've now just traced that within seconds using a keyboard shortcut. Now, it could be that a customer sends you a sketch of a logo and says, this is what I want my logo to look like. So you scan it in and you try to convert that to vectors. Now, there's one rule that you really should follow if you want to get a good result with line tracing. And that is never use a pencil, never use a biro. They both create lines that have um, varying densities of the line. So when you try to trace it, you get a lot of objects of different colors and the lines tend to be very bitty. So um, if you yourself like to sketch, because a lot of people are not quite sure how to use all of these drawings. So if you're not sure and you again yourself tend to sketch something, scan it in then use either a magic mark or something like a fine mark, like a, I call them a Sharpie. Sharpie, for example, <laughs> or an ink pen, something that's going to give you a nice solid line. So if we look in this, for example, this was created using something like that. So yeah. let's just do a very quick line trace. Ah, I can see a question come in. Yeah, we can read that one. So somebody's just asked uh, for the best mode to use when tracing bitmap text get very mixed results as it seems to distort all the text. Uh, I need the vector to back the bitmap with white for printing on clear vinyl. <laughs> so as a, as a vectorizing text is one of the most difficult things to do and it's completely correct. You rarely get a good result of that. Um, we would normally advise use the original text, vectorize the rest, just remove the text and use original text. Um, now, up until recently, or up until recently, we've still got it, we had, a, we had a feature in here called What the Font. And this worked fantastically until about a month ago, when the What the Font website owners, which is my fonts, decided to change their website format from HTML to SHTML, or they did something to the website which actually broke this feature, in, we didn't break the feature in CoreDraw. CoreDraw was trying to access a specific website because what happened was you brought in your image, um, you brought in your image, you clicked on what the font, dragged a selection box, and then it just went up to the website and told you what font that actually was. And it worked fantastically until about a month ago. So our development guys are actually talking to what the font, I can't tell you when it's going to be fixed. But that was the best way of doing font recognition. And that is always better than trying to trace font. Tracing fonts work better if it's a, a sans serif font, which means it's got no little corners and edges and curly bits on it. Um, but for the moment, you need to try and do some sort of font recognition and use the font possible. Now, I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more in depth when we look at the Corel Font Manager, because once you've done some type of font recognition and the website says, we think this is font A, B, C, or D, 
then you can actually take that into the font manager and, and look to see if you've got that font or something similar. But that's coming up a little bit later. So I'm going to stick with tracing at the moment. So I've got a line trace here that's been scanned in. I'm going to go to line art. And let's just let that scan in for a second. And the first thing I'm going to do is remove the color from the entire image. Now important with line art is that you make sure you've got all the details. So in this case, I'm just going to up the detail slider to get as much detail as I can. I'm going to check the colors. That's great. Now, I don't know why this is. Whenever you, whenever you trace something, you're always going to have white here, even though there's no white in the image. Do not remove that by clicking on the, on the trash can. Leave that in. It doesn't make any difference to the vectorized results. So I'm just going to click on OK. This is now our vector. And what we can do is we can use something like the Smart Tool. Let's just take this out. And we can just go in and start filling areas of that vector now. So that was a quick line trace to vector. You can go in and, and edit that as you can any other vector. So let's say you need to create a really simple logo. Now, one of the big drawbacks of, of converting any pixel-based image, JPEG, PNG, GIF, TIFF, is because it's based on pixels, you're going to have lots of nodes all over the place. And especially if you're doing vinyl cutting, any sort of plotting or engraving, the fewer the nodes, the better. Um, in the past, when you tried to remove nodes, you had this a node reduction slider up here, which you still have. But the disadvantage of, of reducing nodes using the property bar is that it reduces nodes throughout the object, even in places where you didn't actually want the nodes reduced. So we've got a better way of doing this now. So we're going to start off by tip number one. If you need something like this seagull, for example, for a logo, just crop out the bit that you need because we don't want to waste time trying to vectorize all the, the background here. So here's our seagull. Let's make him a little bit bigger. And now we're just going to do a very simple logo trace. Just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Now, let's try to remove the background. Because there's so much blue here, it doesn't actually know which is the background and which isn't. So we're going to say specify color. And I'm going to hold down the shift key so that I can pick up multiple colors. So let's just go through the background and just pick up multiple colors. I don't need to worry about the colors in this case because I just want the outline of the seagull. So I'm going to delete the original image and just say OK. Right, the next thing I'm going to do is run a boundary around this. Now I can go up to my objects and go down to here and go to boundary, but that's too much scrolling, which is the reason I pop that on my custom toolbar. So here's my outline. And let's just zoom in here, Z on the keyboard to zoom in. And now I'm just going to turn this outline yellow so that we can see the nodes a little bit better. So I choose my shape tool and now we can see I've got a lot of nodes here. So we've got a fantastic tool and that is called the smooth tool. Now the smooth tool has two properties. It has size and it has strength. So we can do a strong smoothing or a very subtle smoothing. If you hold down the shift key, you can change the size. If you hold down the Alt key, you can change the strength. So I'm just going to go into here. And let's just zoom down here. And let's just go down. And we can see where all the pixels were. I'm just going to go down here and reduce that. Perhaps that smoothing's a little bit too strong. I'm just going to reduce the strength, reduce the size a little bit, and just go down here. And you can see on screen how the nodes are being reduced. Let's go down here a little bit. Let's go up to the head. So I'm just going down here, reducing the nodes. 
And as I said, it's up to you where you want to reduce the notes. You might have a, a drawing where you actually need more detail. And when I'm done, I'm just going to fill that with a little bit of colour. And that's our logo. Now, you might be doing screen printing and you might want to take a, an image, turn it into a vector, but at the same time, sort of keep the colours together so that you can split that off into separations and do some screen printing with it. So we've got an image here, which is, as you can see, um, it's got gradients in it, it's got lots of pointy bits, lots of pixels. Let's take that back into Trace and this time we're going to choose Detailed Logo. I'll just let this, that do one run through. It's got a lot more to think about now, so we give it, let it do its thing. Just check in with you guys whilst that was working. Um, is there any, any questions whilst we've been going through this? And is everybody still, somebody can hear okay? Okay, looks like. Perfect, yeah, uh -huh. spot, yeah. Uh -huh. brilliant. Just checking you're still with us. <laughs> right, now in this case, because we want detail, we're going over to the color tab. And as you can see, it's a JPEG, so it's RGB. Now is the time to choose which palette you actually want to work in. So you could choose the Roland System palette, you can choose a Pantone palette, and if you click on more palettes, that will give you access to all of the different palettes that are available in Core Draw Graphic Suite. But just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to leave it as it is, but I am going to reduce the colors. Let's go down to, let's try eight colors or perhaps seven colors. Just going to let that run through again. Now, some of these colors are pretty similar, so I could do one of two things. I could um, just select two of the colors and say merge, and it'll merge it to an average of those colors. And the color that's selected is shown here by these white stripes, but I'm actually going to edit this color so that we can actually see the different colors when we uh, create our separations. Um, these two I am going to merge. I'm going to hold down the control key, merge those two. Just edit this one. I've got terrible taste in color, guys, but it, it works for this for this demonstration. Now, back on the settings tab, I've got the option here to group objects by color. So I'm going to do that now. And I'm just going to say OK. So here is our vector. Um, I can do one of two things. Now, um, first of all, I'm just going to open up a Docker that you might not be aware of, and that's the Color Styles Docker. If you're doing T-shirt print or textile print, of course, not every design is going to work well on a specific color background. So that might not, not look good on a yellow t-shirt, for example. But if I drag that whole design over to the bottom panel of the color styles, pan, uh, color styles docker, it's offering to create groups of colors for me, which I'm going to do. And I'm just going to say OK to that. If I now click on this, I can now go through the color wheel and it's just going to change those colors on the fly for me. So I can get different color variations depending on what the background is. So I'm now going to ungroup this because every traced object comes out as a group. I'm just going to um, ungroup this and start pulling this apart. So as you see here, we've got different, the different colors sorted into groups. So I've got my different separations if I'm doing screen printing. So another bugbear is uh, a customer sends you uh, a photo, the quality is not very good. So I've got here an original JPEG image. As I zoom in here, you can see the quality is not good. I know in advance, this is going to give me lots of lots of nodes when I trace this. And this is down to anti-aliasing because it's creating um, pixels of different colors. So what some people try to do is, which sounds logical when you think about it, is they take 
this image and in color draw they go up and they resample it and they say right let's it's got the last settings here let's do a 300 pixel sample here and if i go in and look at this now from a distance it looks sharper but as i zoom in i've got even more anti-aliasing so i've got more colors here so again it's not going to give me a clean result but luckily you've got a free plugin with CorelDRAW 2018 well, actually this plugin has been there i think since CorelDRAW x6 and it's called PhotoZoom Pro 4. Now, in 2018, it's not built into the program. You need to go to Get More and look for the plugin under the extensions and just install it yourself. It's free. So let's take this image and I'm going to now go into Photo Paint by clicking on Edit Bitmap. So it's going to open up Photo Paint. So, and in Photo Paint, we're going to go to File, Export 4, PhotoZoom Pro 4. Now, you'll see both here because I love this program so much, I went out and bought version 7. But for just turning something into a vector, um, version 4 works fine. So, what you can do here is you can let's put 300 DPI in here as well, and it's going to go through... And already I can see I'm going to get a much better result. So all I need to do is save this now. And I've already done this. So I've saved it as just a file called 300 DPI. So let's bring the file that I saved before the webinar started. I've lost my mouse. Here we go. Oops. It's because Joe and myself are sharing screens. So sometimes the mouse disappears. There we go. So I'm just going to delete this and bring in the one that I, as used to say in Blue Peter, here's one I created earlier. And I'm just going to trace this now. So remove color from the whole image. And let's say OK. So let's just flip this over and just compare. So this is 300 DPI resampled in Core Draw, and this is 300 DPI um, in PhotoZoom and then traced. And you can see I've got a really good result here. I might need to go in and just reduce a couple of nodes, but I've got a really good result, much better than I would have had if I just traced it as it was. Now, this looks as if it'd be quite easy to trace. It's just, it looks like it's just two colors, but if you zoom in, because this image has quite a high color bit depth, I've got actually dozens of variations of this brown color. So if I go into trace and I choose, let's say, clip art, We'll just let this run through. So what have I got here? I've got 57 curves. I've got 4,700 nodes and eight colors. So if we just zoom into this, this is not really something, something you want to see, okay? So what I'm going to do is, because it's going to be a logo at the end of the day, I'm just going to go over and convert this to grayscale. So now I've got a maximum of um, 256 colors. So I'm just going to go down here and I'm going to start by merging my gray colors together. Perhaps I can even get away with merging these two. So, and I'm just going to leave it like this. So, at the moment, I've now got two curves, 800 nodes, and just three colors. <clears throat> so, just by converting this to grayscale, I can put one more color in. Let's try one more darker color. 
I'm just trying to imagine these. I mean, you have to play have to play around with it to get the best result for you. So that's fine. I've now got two colours. Let's say OK. So I've reduced that down. I've just got two colours now. All I need to do is ungroup this. I can use the smooth tool if I've got any lumps and bumps. And otherwise, I can use the shape tool just to tidy up the black here by just extending it. So grayscale is the way to go if you're getting a really sort of a, 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 a trace that's got lots of, lots of different objects in there. So we're now going to do the hardest thing to trace. Now, if we look at this, we've got skin tones, we've got hair, we've got transparent netting here. So if I try to um, trace this, again, I'm going to get a, a result similar to before. I'm going to get lots of different objects with lots of jagged edges and thousands of nodes. So I like to do the following. So and for this, we're going to look in our object manager. So here's my image. So the first thing I'm going to do is hit plus on my keyboard to create a duplicate. So here we can see I've got the image now twice here. So the bottom image, I'm going to right click and lock it. So I've locked the bottom image down to the page. The top image I'm going to trace. So let's go up here, do a quick logo trace. And I'm not worrying about the colors here. I just want the vector objects. So I'm just going to say OK. So that leaves me with a group of vector objects sitting on top of my original image. I'm going to run an outline around those vector objects. Once I've done that, I can actually delete the vector objects. And I'm doing this all in the object manager. So let's just delete those. So what I have now is my outline running around my image. I could even give this outline a cut contour color if I wanted to just cut round, just print the image and cut that out. But if I really want vectors because I want this as a logo, all I need to do is grab my freehand tool, and I'm doing this really quickly, quick guys. When, when you're doing this at home, you can do this with more precision. So I've created a line here, and using my Smart Fill tool, no outline, I'm just going to pick up the skin color and fill that area with the skin color. So now I can get rid of this line here. Let's just do one or two lines more. So again, I'm just going to Draw the line, use the Smart Fill tool. Oops, that was the wrong colour. I should have picked up the hair colour. Click, and then just remove the line. So you can just go around, just go around the drawing, just marking off areas. And it can be, it doesn't have to be too, too precise. And just filling those areas with the colour using the Smart Fill tool. And that will give you um, a logo pretty quickly. Oops, just a second there. There was a question there asking what tool were you using to create those lines? Just I was quick. using, just using the freehand tool. Yeah, but you can actually use any of the drawing tools. So I was just using the freehand tool. Of course, if you have a Wacom tablet at home with a, with, a, with a stylus, you can work really precisely. But sort of trying to draw with a mouse is always a bit hit and miss. But just going through that, if I just... Um, so if I just unlock this image, let's just unlock it and just delete it. Um, it's giving you something like this, basically. Okay. Right, before we leave the topic of tracing, are there any questions about tracing? No? Okay, then moving on. So we have a brand new tool in Corridor 2018, and that is the Block Shadow tool. So this, um, this here was created using the Extrusion tool. So if I go over here, you've got the Extrude tool, but that's got a couple of very big disadvantages. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Block Shadow tool. And I'm just going to drag out a Block Shadow. And I'm just going to pick up the color from this object here. So they both look pretty similar, but if I now go into wireframe mode, 
This is the difference. When you're using extrusions, you've got lots of complex parts, and these don't plot very well. And it's also a bit of a nightmare if you want to pull this apart because you want to cut out the letter and cut out the shadow separately. The block shadow tool, on the other hand, is going to give you nice, clean objects. So what else can we do with the block shadow tool? Well, we can choose to overprint it. And if you choose overprint, it's going to print the block shadow on top of the underlying objects. We can choose to remove the holes. So if you want to remove the holes, you can do that. We can add an extension here. So if I type in two millimeters, it extends the block shadow around the outside. And we can also simplify it. And when we simplify it, what happens is the letter is used as a cookie cutter to punch a hole through the shadow. So let's click on simplify. And I'm going to right click here and say, break block shadow apart. So I'm breaking those objects apart. And now I can basically pull this apart. And I've got two nice clean objects, which, which you can plot out perfectly on your roll and plotter cutter. Okay, so really good tool, block shadow tool. Any questions about the block shadow tool? I mean, it's really simple to use. Okay, okay that was a <coughs> that was really impressive. I, I like the way you could add the outline, so it's kind of effectively adding a a bit of a bleed if somebody were to be adding a as well. Line yeah, or so. exactly. Right, our Swiss Army knife. So we've got a knife tool over here. Now the knife tool can do different things. See, let's just zoom in here, first of all. So the knife tool can do a straight cut, a freehand cut, and a bezier cut. Let's just do a simple straight cut through this object. So I've cut the object. By the way, guys, if you tap on the space bar, the space bar will toggle between the last tool you use is the pick tool. So again, time save. You don't have to keep going up here to the pick tool. Just tap the space bar. Okay, let's move this out. So I've cut that through now. So I could theoretically just go in here and start reshaping that. Okay. The knife tool can also cut, but at the same time, close the objects after cutting. So let's choose auto close. Let's cut through here. Hit the space bar, and I've now got closed objects. I've got to make sure I don't go too far over to this end. So I've now got closed objects, which um, you can then fill if you need to. Let's go down here. So what I have here is an outline. So if I choose my shape tool, the only thing I can do here is basically change the direction of the length, because this is actually an outline uh, with arrowheads here. Now, if I choose my knife tool, at the moment it's set to automatic, but I can choose after cutting to convert this outline to objects. So let's just do this, convert to objects, choose the freehand cut. So I'm going to choose a freehand cut here. And now what I have is no longer um, an, outline, uh, an outline, it's actually an object, so I can go in here and start reshaping this. Okay, so let's just undo that one more time. So, and the last type of cut uh, that I can do is I can preserve the outline properties. So if I cut through this now, select it first of all. There go. So now it's cut it, but it's actually preserve the properties of each part of the outline. So it's actually preserved the arrowheads here. So you've got different options when you're cutting through uh, objects with outlines, what happens to those outlines. So we also have the option, let's zoom out a little bit here. Let's do a straight cut, but let's now cut with a gap. So I can choose to cut with a gap and let's do a five millimeter gap in here. And let's just cut through here. And I've got my gap here. What I need to do now is just, um, is just ungroup this. And once I've ungrouped it, I can take both halves of my object and just move it around then. So that's cutting with a gap. 
And the final thing we can do is to cut with an overlap. So if you're doing vehicle signage and you are folding your, your um, design around a door or frame or something like that, and you want to have the design matching up, you can cut uh, with an overlap. Let's just go to overlap here. And this is also a group of objects. You can see here I've got a group of five objects. It's five objects stacked on top of each other. Let's go right through here. Let's go down here. Let's ungroup these. And let's just select the bit that we've cut. And as you can see, the five, uh, the five millimeter overlap is five millimeters here. You've got your overlap here. So again, the knife tool would really useful. Swiss Army knife. Can do a lot of things with that. So now I'm sure that at some point you need to do mock-ups for your customers, especially if you're doing packaging, something like that. Now, before Core 2018, you could only apply perspectives and envelopes to vector objects. In 2018, you can apply these two effects to vectors, text, and bitmaps. So let's give this a go. So first of all, starting with envelopes, you've got, of course, over here, you've got the envelope tool, but you've actually also got an envelope docker, which gives you a few more options. Let's just open up that envelope docker. So you've got preformed shapes here. So if you've got an image and you just want to, or a vector, and you want to fit it into a preformed shape, you've got these different shapes here on offer. But I'm going to just select my image here and I'm going to choose to fit it to a container. So I just created a simple shape here. I'm going to click on this, point to my container. Come on. And my image is now taken on the shape of that container. So I'm just going to take this away now and just move that down here. And I can do really quick mock-ups with that. So over here, I've got a bitmap. Let's just zoom in a little bit. I've got a bitmap. I've got a vector shape. And on top of that, I've got some text sitting. So I've got a group of objects here. So I'm now going to go up to Effect, Add Perspective. And I should have actually moved it over a bit more over here to start off with. Uh, what I also like to do is I like, sometimes like to go into wireframe mode when I'm doing this, because I can actually see what I'm doing here a little bit better. So let's just drag those down here. So I go back into enhanced mode. So I missed that a bit. Let's go back into wireframe mode. Ah, because I was on the bounding box and not on the, on the cardboard box. Something like this. And it's just going to let you do, um, do that really quickly. So down here, we can do something similar. Let's just bring my image over here. Um, effects, that's where we've got perspective on it. Let's just clear that effect. Add perspective, let's just go over here quickly. See if I can find the corners here. Now I'm going to go into wireframe mode again because I want to grab my knife tool and just make sure. Now the property bar of the knife tool doesn't automatically reset itself. So just remember if you're using it just to go in and set it back. So I'm just going to go through here really quickly, cut through this, hit the space bar, just delete this. Go back into enhancement so you get the general idea of what I'm aiming at here. Well, there's a quick question there, Suzanne. How do you switch to the wireframe mode? Now, you can either go under view, wireframe, but this is all about saving time. So I basically, this didn't have a, a keyboard shortcut to start off with. So I just went to tools, customization, commands. I looked for wireframe view. It's just wireframe. It's 
set it up. Right, so I'm just going to go to the view menu. Let's go back to the view menu. So that would be here under wireframe. And under shortcut keys, I just gave it a key. I just typed in W and said assign. OK. And I also um, gave a key shortcut to enhance, which is the view that you normally have in Corel Draw. Where was that? Enhanced. Enhanced. So and I gave myself a keyboard shortcut here. Because the whole thing about saving time is um, if you do a thing again and again and again, you don't want to have to be going up and down with your mouse. If you can use keyboard shortcuts, it's obviously a lot quicker. Right. Um, brand new tool in CorelDRAW. Um, as far as I'm aware, if you want to use this tool in Adobe Illustrator, you need to buy a plugin for it. So the symmetry tool is brand new and you can use the symmetry tool in different ways. I've got a clip art here, uh, a, a clip art here, any sort of clip art, and I'm just going to right click it and choose create new symmetry. Now I'm just going to move the axis over. And I've got one axis here, but up here I can add additional axes here. So I've got two axes, three axes. And what I can do here is I can toggle the symmetry view on or off so I can see what the final design is going to look like. I can also um, toggle the axis on and off. So if I just want to see what it looks like without the axis in the way, but I can still go through um, creating multiple axes here. Let's just turn this back on again. Um, down here, you've got a little toolbar, and that's the symmetry toolbar. So I can either edit my symmetry I can break the symmetry link. If I break the symmetry, then it's no longer an object that I can continue to edit by adding more or less axes. Um, and I can actually remove the symmetry altogether. OK, so that's one thing you can do with it. So I've also got something here. If you're trying to create logos, I mean, sometimes it's difficult drawing something symmetrically. OK, if you end up using circles and, and rectangles, but that's a bit boring. So if you draw half of something, Again, you can click on this, say create new symmetry. Let's just move the axis over here where we want it. And I can go in with my shape tool and I can start changing this. And I'm going to get a fantastic uh, symmetrical logo here just by changing the symmetry here. Just to finish editing that. And finally, you can actually uh, create a symmetry from scratch. So let's just get rid of these. Under object, you've also got the object here. So I've lost it here. I'm just right click on the desktop here, create new symmetry. And for example, if I choose my artistic media tool, I can start here. Let's just turn off this preview. And I can do all sorts of symmetries in here. So I mean, it's a really fantastic tool. Just increase the axis here. That is, my friends, the symmetry tool. So I'm just going to close down a few windows here and then just remove this. Okay. Um, moving on. Now, previous versions of CorelDRAW, they you could go out to get more, and there was a whole lot of um extensions to pick from. Some of them were three, but, but the ones I'm going to show you now, you used to have to buy. So the first extension I'm going to look at is called the Pointalyzer. And the Pointalyzer is going to allow you to create a sort of a half turn effect. So I'm going to click on this, go to cocktail, that's another one, but we're not going to be looking at that today. Pointalyzer. So it's going to create sort of a half turn effect. So I'm going to start by increasing the density of my dots. So you can change the density, the size of the dots, the screen angle. And at the moment, we've got a choice between circle and square. I'm just going to leave it circle, click on apply. And I've got a nice little half turn effect going on here. Okay, I could just as well choose square, for example. And let's apply that. 
because the point slicer works on bitmaps, but it also works on vectors. So here I've applied a sort of a mosaic effect. We've also got something here called custom. So if I go over here and choose custom, I can select the object I want to use. Let's just point at this. And now I'm going to apply this heart pattern to my text here. If I zoom in here, I've now applied that heart to that. Um, I can select a different shape. Let's just, first of all, let's just undo this. Let's just go back one. Select this. I just want to undo that. And let's click apply. And again, this is really useful for doing like company logos. So now I've used the letter L just to fill that shape with. So again, a really nice little tool and I'm sure you'll find uh, uses for it. Fitting objects to paths. Let's close this one down and let's open up fit objects to path. Now you can fit one object or multiple objects to any path. I happen to have a circle here, but it can be a, a, a freehand path or it can be any path you choose. So let's fit one object first. So I'm selecting one object and you hold the shift key to select the path. So because I've only got one object, I'd like some duplicates. Let's say, let's say 12 duplicates. I'm going to leave everything else of it as it is in the standard settings. So at the moment, these objects are going to be placed uh, using their center point along this path. Let's click apply. So that was easy enough. So I've got, I've got my objects on the center of this path. Let's go back. Now let's choose all of these objects. Hold down the shift key, select the path. Now I don't want any duplicates, let's put zero in here. But now I can choose a selection order. So let's have big to small. And let's have them aligned along the bottom edge over here. Let's click apply. So now I've got my objects from big to small fitted to a path using the bottom edge. So what I did over here, for example, was I selected a couple of designs, held down the shift key, selected the path, I'll leave everything as it is and just say apply. So I've now used this and if you're doing like sort of fashion design, you can use this for buttons or or rivets or whatever you want that needs to be to be spaced out, you can use the fit object to path tool. Now, if any of you are out there doing your own drawing, that means you draw designs yourself, you create your own logos, or you need to edit stuff. Now, I don't know about you, um, my eyes are getting worse as I get older, and trying to work with these fiddly little nodes here is painful. Also, looking at these nodes, I can't really see what I'm actually working with. So I'm going to go back into my options, and I'm going to go to nodes and handles. And the first thing I'm going to do is increase the size of the nodes. Okay. Now we've got three types of nodes we can work with. A cusp node lets you create a right angle. So let's use a little pointy symbol for that. So a smooth node as a circle is fine. And a symmetrical node, I'm going to use a square for that. Okay. Um, I'm going to choose custom colors. And I want the different nodes, node types to appear in different colors. So as soon as I see a node, I know what this node is going to do. So let's say OK. So let's just zoom into this. So now I can see I've got a cusp tool, here, a cusp node here. I can see the nodes. I can do a nice pointy angle here. This is a smooth node. So now I can do a nice smooth curve here. And this is a symmetrical node. So it just makes it working with nodes so much easier because you can actually tell what nodes you're working with and you can actually see the nodes. Okay. Now, let's just open. I'm going to show you another new feature using my mouse here. There we go. So I'm going to open up our Align and Distribute Docker. Now, before CorelDRAW 2018, 
you could align and distribute objects. With 2018, you can now um, align and distribute nodes. So I'm just going to turn this outline yellow. And let's just zoom into this. So you're trying to draw a logo, but you're not quite good at drawing things sort of in a regular shape. So we're now going to do a line and distribute. So the first thing I'm going to do with my shape tool, I'm going to select the nodes on the left and I'm going to say a line left. Now I'm going to select the nodes on the right and say a line right. And I'm going to select the whole lot and say distribute vertically. So I've now taken a design and I'm able to create a nice evenly spaced design by aligning and distributing nodes. Now, if, if someone's asked you to, to create a design or create a logo, sometimes you have, to, you have days where the, the Greek muse of design isn't just you know, shining on you and it's really hard to think about what can I use to create a design. Now you do have 10,000 clip arts in Coral Draw, which you can access by using Coral Connect. But you not only have the 10,000 clip arts, you can actually cannibalize these clip arts just by using bits of them that you need. So let's do that. I've got one clip art here that I'm going to ungroup. And I actually don't want to use any of this. So I'm just going to get rid of everything I don't want to use. Now, I don't need all these lines here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab my shape tool. Now, with the shape tool, you can do a rectangular selection by just dragging it out. But if you hold down the Alt key, you can do a freehand selection, which is what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to do a freehand selection and I'm going to go copy, paste. So what this has done is it's just isolated a bit of that design for me. So I'm just going to keep that over here. And let's do the next one over here. So let's just first of all start by, oh, it's already ungrouped, that's fine. So again, I'm going to grab my shape tool, holding down the Alt key, I'm going to go around the outside and copy and paste. So we've now got our little bird here. And the last one we're going to do is a little bit trickier. Let's just ungroup this. Get rid of this here. So grab my shape tool. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put the nodes back to a smaller size so that I can see what I'm doing here. So let me just go back and change that node size again. Now I'm going to grab my shape tool and holding down the Alt key, I'm going to go around here. Copy, paste, but now when I move it, I'm not seeing anything because this object doesn't have an outline and it's open at the bottom. You can see that gap at the bottom. So what I need to do is first of all, I need to get an outline so that I can see it. Let's do hairline here. And I'm going to grab my shape tool, drag the nodes over, and once it's closed, it automatically fills itself. Okay, so let's put that whole thing together. So I've got a bird here. Let's just flip him around, make it a little bit smaller. So I've just used three clip arts to create a, a completely new design. Do we have any questions on working with nodes at all before we move on? No, okay. Moving on. Now, find and replace is a really useful tool. If you've got these lines here you, on the screen, they look as if they're all the same width, but actually they've got they've got different widths. If I click on this, this is hairline. And down here I've got 0 0.1. So if you've got a design and it's really important to have all the outlines exactly the same width, then you can do the following. We're going to go up to edit find and replace and we're going to find objects so we've got the find wizard so let's click on next 
and we are going to look for outlines and we're going to look for the outlines by using the outline properties. Let's click on next. And what we want is a specific width. So we want to look for the outlines that are 0 0.1 millimeters. And you've got different properties. You could search by color, you could search by overprint. So you've got different criteria here that you can search for. So I'm going to say next, finish. I'm going to say find all. So it's now found all of the lines that are 0 0.1. So I could now choose hairline, for example, but just to make sure we see what we've found, I'm going to make them quite a bit thicker. As you can see, it's found those lines and I can change them all at the same time. So we can also use this for finding fonts. So let's go back into edit, um, find and replace, find objects. And this time we're going to be looking for text. And I'm going to specify the properties. And I'm looking for no font, I'm looking for a font. So again, you can look for, for certain text words, weight, alignment, you've got a lot of criteria here. Let's look for area because that's quick. Next, finish, find all. And I can go up here and choose the font that I actually want to use, which is Arnold Bocklin. And finally, you can edit the search and go back into that, change the search criteria. So this time I'm looking for uh, fills, uniform fill. I'm going to look for a specific color. So choose my eyedropper. Let's take this blue here. Next, finish, find all, and I can just go over here now and change all of the objects with that colour in one go. And this is particularly useful if you're doing, uh, if you're using um, multi-page documents and you need to change something really quickly. So, power clipping. When you power clip, you're basically taking one type of object. The object can be a bitmap, a vector, text, and you're placing it inside another object. So you can, you can place it inside a vector or inside text. You obviously can't place it in a bitmap. And there are different things you can do with this. So for example, let's say I'm doing a catalog. I've just done a rough outline here of this, um, this woman's dress. I'm just going to drag this with my right mouse button. I'm going to say power clip inside. And at the bottom here, we've got the power clip toolbar. So I can just go in here and edit the power clip by just, for example, dragging this up and just saying finish edit. And I can also remove this, remove this red outline so we don't see the outline. And if you're doing a catalog, you've got all your different colors or all your different textures, and you can just keep dragging these in. If you want to drag in multiple objects into one power clip, um, you can drag that in as well. You can power clip that inside. So that's all also an option that you have. And let's just drag this over here. Let's put, it, put that uh, into our text here. And I'm just going to say fill the frame proportionally. And then it will just fit the whole of that text for me. And let's just extract that again. And what I have here is a piece of graph paper. So let's say, for example, you've got um, tiles that you can sublimate onto. Let's just put, pop this into our graph paper, power clip inside, and let's just fill that proportionally. I'm just going to remove the outline here. And I'm going to ungroup this. And once I've ungrouped it, I've now got a tiled image. So if I'm printing out onto tiles, I've got my, my different files here that I can then print out to. So that is basically power clipping. Uh, thank you, Denise, for watching. Perhaps you've gone already. Um, anyone who has to leave, don't worry, as, as, as we said, we're recording this and it will at some point be available 
to watch again so you can pause it, play back, rewind, anything you want to do. Okay, font manager. Now, um, I'm sure everybody out there has got hundreds, if not thousands of fonts. And what makes it even more difficult is you've got a certain project and you're looking for a certain style or a look and you're having to scroll down long lists of font looking for a font that you want. So if you use the Corel Font Manager, you can start sorting your fonts. And the great thing is from now on, from this point forward, you don't have to install a font to be able to use it in CorelDRAW. The other thing you need to, if you, if, you, if you buy fonts yourself, you need to make sure that, the, um, it's up to you really, um, if you're sending a file off to, some, to somebody else, some fonts um, can't be embedded because the font manufacturers put a, a, a break on that, you can't embed the fonts. So you can use them yourself, you can print them yourself, but you can't send them off anywhere. So that's just one thing to bear in mind. So let's have a look at the Corel Font Manager. So I'm going up to the launch pad and I'm going to open Corel Font Manager. So let's just make this a little bit bigger. So my fonts is showing you every font on my machine. And as you can see down the bottom, I've been really naughty. I've got 1,500 fonts installed. Now the fonts are color coded. Fonts that are installed are color coded green. Um, protected system fonts, I'm just gonna click on a filter here. Protected system fonts are uh, have a padlock and what this means is you can't install or uninstall them by mistake. Very important. Um, the fonts that are installed, you can, from here, uninstall a font. Fonts that are on your machine but haven't yet been installed are color-coded yellow. If I right-click here, I can install the font here. I can also show duplicate fonts. And I've also got the option to add them to a collection or to open the location where this file is. Um, if I click on Content Exchange, now you get 1,000 fonts with CorelDRAW, but these fonts are not on your machine, they're waiting for you in the cloud, which is why they're color-coded white. If I right-click on this, I've got the option to install the font from the cloud, but as I mentioned earlier, we don't need to install the font, so it will be enough just to download the font and have it sitting on my hard drive somewhere, I can still use it in CorelDRAW. So um, I won't do that now, just bear in mind that it's that it's there. And anything that's color-coded gray means that you've got a font family where you can store some font and not all of the font. So back to my own font collection. If I click on a font, over here I've got the font information, font properties. So this lets me look at all the glyphs in a particular font. I can also choose, let's just open this up a bit, to show just the Latin um, characters or just the numbers or just the currency. And I can select these and copy paste them. I've also got the font information. So the font information tells me um, which code pages are supported and who the font manufacturer is and how old the font is. So back to the filters on this side. I've got the option to import folders. So if you've got a folder sitting on your desktop where you've been collecting fonts, you can actually import this folder. So over here, I've actually got a folder sitting on my C drive where I collect all my college type fonts. If I'm, if I'm printing out onto a, I don't know, a college uh, sweatshirt or something like that, this is where I've got my college fonts. As you can see, I've only actually got one installed. All the rest are not installed, but I can use them in Coral Draw. If I right click here, I've got the option to uninstall the fonts or to remove this folder. I'm not deleting the folder from my hard drive, I'm just removing it from this list here. We've also got the option of creating a collection, which I'm going to do now. So let's create a collection and let's call this wedding. Now a collection is a virtual folder. So I can, so I, for example, if I just, I just bring this down a little bit, I've sorted my, my collections into themes that make sense for me. So I've got my sci-fi fonts, I've got my scripts, I've got my sans serif. So, so the collections you can choose yourself. My wedding collection is empty at the moment, so we're going to start putting some fonts in there. 
So the filters I'm going to use, I want to use fonts that are installed and not installed. Um, you can look for fonts that allow embedding or don't allow embedding. I'm going to use open type fonts. I'm going to use light and regular weights. And I'm going to use scripts. So as I've been turning on these filters, it's been basically filtering down through my fonts, deciding which fonts it thinks meet my criteria. So I'm just going to drag these over to my wedding collection. And that's all I need to do. I'm just going to turn off or, or close call font manager again. And if I now go up to my font list, I've got the option here of opening my filter panel and I can now go down to my wedding collection. And these are the fonts that I chose for my wedding collection. And you can see these changing on the right in real time. I can also clear the filters here. And I can also, if I don't want to go into the font manager, I can start sorting out my font list here using the filters in this panel here, for example. So if I want to go down to my collections and choose just my fonts that are slabs, it's just going to show me all my fonts that are slab fonts. So really useful tool. Now, soft proofing. You may or may not have noticed a little icon at the bottom here in the status bar. That is your proof color icon. Now, we've already set up our, our color management in a little bit earlier. So we went into color management, set that up. What we want to do now is check if the colors on our screen are looking the way we want them to look by doing a soft proof. So we're going over here, and this might be a panel that you might want to leave open. So we've got here our color proof settings. I'm going to turn the color proofing on. And by default, we've got ISO coded V2. I don't know if that's something that, that's used a lot here. No, not necessarily. It's yeah. so probably what another whole conversation going into. So what would you say is a good one to choose here, Joe? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the list there. Uh, probably the Euro scale coded or uh the 39. So your scale coded. Yeah. Let's try that. Now I don't know if you notice that. If I turn this button on or off, let's just zoom in here. So the options that you're selecting here will depend on the color management that you set within VersaWorks. Yeah, exactly. So you can you can have a look within VersaWorks and try and marry up the same uh, soft proof within within Coral. So I think you can see, if you can see slightly if you look at the lemons, that as I turn the color proofing on or off, I am seeing seeing it change on the screen. Okay. So and what you can also do here is uh, you've got the option to export it as a JPEG, TIFF, or PDF, and you can also print a proof. Okay, um, so I mean, you can also do something really extreme here, but choose something like newspaper, then you're going to see a huge difference here. You've also got the option to turn the gamut warning on or off. And um, once you've set it up here, I'm just going to go back to this one. So once you've set it up here, you don't need to leave this panel open. I can close this panel and I can still turn it on or off just by using this icon at the bottom here. Okay. Now, variable data printing. I've got VersaWorks Jewel installed on my machine here. Let's say someone's asked you to do a, a printout. So you've got a, quite a big job where, you, where the basic design stays the same. So let's imagine this was a team, a team player shirt or something like a football shirt. So if you've got your, you've got your football team, you've got the reserves, you've got I don't know how many people here. They all need shirts. So you've got a basic design here, and we're going to do a variable data print. Now, the advantage of this is all you need to do in CorelDRAW is create the design and create fields for data. And the data in this case is the name of the player and the player number. The important thing is, this is my Excel spreadsheet, by the way, is that the, the top, the columns of the data all start with capital letter, VDP underscore whatever. So I've got team name here, VDP underscore team number. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to create data fields and the outline color of this data field is going to have exactly the same name as the names in our spreadsheet. Because what happens is when we get into VersaWorks, and we'll be seeing that live in a second, we're going to bring in our design, which we've saved as an EPS file. And once it's in VersaWorks, we're going to point it to the spreadsheet and it's going to match up the data in the spreadsheet with the color of the outline. So far, so good. So here's a typical, oops, a typical example here. Um, we need to do identity, we need to do ID cards for a company. So they've got 50, 50 uh, people working there. So how many bits of data have I got in here? I've got name, job title, employee number. It could even be a barcode. And I've got a, a picture here. If you want to use barcodes, um, the way you do that in your Excel spreadsheet, you would put in the numerical number of the barcode. And once you get into VersaWorks, you swap out the barcode, the, the font, that numerical font for a barcode font. So that basically that number will be converted into a barcode. So let's get this started. So first thing I'm going to do is open up the Color Palette Manager. I'm going to create a new empty palette. And let's call this, uh, let's call this VDP. And that opens up an empty palette. Let's just bring this out over here. And I'm going to start off by just picking up any old color to add to my palette. I'm now going to edit that color. So we need, so this is the image that so I'm just going to call this color VDP underscore image. And the important thing is, is that that color is treated as a spot color. Okay, let's add a color. Let's choose, I don't know, choose a green. I'm going to call this, we need employee number, BDP underscore, underscore employee number. Treat as spot color. Let's do a couple more. Add color. Underscore name. Spot color. BDP underscore uh, job title. And finally, we need to add the Roland cut contour. And I'm going to say OK. And I want to see the names of the colors. OK, so all I'm going to do now is select my image. So just a quick thank you to uh, Mark and Ben. You've had to shoot off, it looks like, in the chat. But thanks for joining us today. Right, so right click. So I've now got my color here. Right click on BDP name. Right click on BDP job title. Right click on BDP employer number. And right click on cut contour. And this I would now export as an EPS file. So I'm now going to leave CorelDRAW and I'm going to go into Roland VersaWorks. Put him down here somewhere. There we go. Now, if you're using images, one thing is really important. In your Excel spreadsheet, under the column VDP underscore image, you need to put the exact path to the image. That might be C slash, I don't know, desktop slash folder, whatever it is. You need to have the path in there so that uh, VersaWorks can find it. So here is my card. I'm going to click on the settings and I'm going to click on a variable data and enable this. So I've now got to point it to my spreadsheet, which I have here. So, and it's just loading the images. So, and you can see here that we've got the path here to the images. And as I go down, the image is changing. 
Now, if you select on the column image, you've got some settings here. So, for example, up here, um, I could fit it proportionally or fit it to a field. I can rotate the image. I can align it. I've got those options. I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted and you're all using Vers VersaWorks anyway. And over here, of course, um, I can adjust the, the, uh, uh, the text, change the font, etc. Don't forget, if you've got double barreled names or long names, don't forget to turn on auto sizing just to make sure that everything fits. Okay, if we go into layout, let me zoom in a little bit here. We can see we've got all of the cards here. And this is basically, I mean, if you've got about 500 or 600 people that you've got to print out cards for, this is such a time save. You do your simple design and draw and just send that off to Roland VersaWorks and let Roland take care of the rest. Okay, let's just go out of here again. Oops, no, I must have said yes to that. So back to Core Draw here. And we're almost finished. Knocking out photos. Now, I get asked a lot, how can I remove the background from an image? Now, if you've got blocks of colours, you can actually do this in Core Draw. What I've got here, for example, I've got two photos on top of each other. So I'm going to open up a window called Bitmap Color Mask. So I'm going to select the top, because you can look for multiple colors. Select the top color here, grab hold of my eyedropper tool, click on the white, and click Apply. Now, I can still see some of the white. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to up the tolerance here. Let's push it all the way up. Click on apply again, and I've now knocked out that white area in the bitmap within Coral Draw. But you can do and that is quite simple. I mean, it was, a, it was a block color, nice straight edges, no big deal. But how about if I've got somebody with lots of hair blowing in the breeze? What do we do about that? Let's go into Photo Paint. So I'm just launching Photo Paint. And we're nearly finished, guys. Thank you for being so patient. We've got three pages to go. So let's open up a couple of the images that I had opened up recently. Right, so I've got a nice young lady here with lots of wavy hair. Let's knock out the background. So we're going to image cut out layer. And I'm just going to maximize this. Now, with Cutout Lab, the smaller the, pin, the smaller the brush you can work with, the more exact it's going to be. At the moment, I'm set at 50. Looks about right. And you're going to be, you're going to try to stay half on, half off of the background. Because um, we need to try and work out what bits we need to remove here. And again, this is something which is all, all, also fantastic to do if you've got something like a Wacom tablet to hand. Don't be afraid of lifting up the mouse and putting it down again. It works well with both. So I'm just doing a little thing here. And don't worry about making any mistakes because you can correct those as well. And I've got some hair down here. Right, so once you've gone around the outside, get your paint bucket here, just fill it and click on preview. So and now what we're going to do is we're going to go around the outside and we're going to correct any little bits. So up here you've got an add brush and you can also use the keyboard shortcut A for add. And we've got the remove brush, which is R for remove. So let's click on add and perhaps make this a little bit smaller because we're doing more touching up here. And I'm just going to put that back in. Just go over here. It's not looking too bad. I'm just going to press R for remove and remove some of this. 
So I press H to go back to the hand or pan into one. A for add. And as I said, I did this really quickly. I mean, it's not done too bad a job. And let's go add in here. R for remove. Go back and clean this up. I won't spend too much time doing this. H to pan around and we have to clean that up down here again. A for add. And R for remove. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit down here. Okay, as I said, if I had a Wacom tablet, I could have been much precise, much more precise with this. So I'm just going to leave this like this and just say, okay. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it onto the background. Move her down a bit. Now the colours don't really match, and I, and I should have been a little bit cleaner here. Okay. By the way, um, I just said okay, um, okay to save this. If, it, if instead of saying okay, I would have said save as clip mask, I could have gone in with a brush here and using black and white, I could have painted with transparency. So I could have taken a black paintbrush and just painted out the little bits that are left over here. It's just because I'm rushing a bit today. Just a quick question, is that, um, <clears throat> what tool did you originally use to draw around the image? Let's, um, let's just undo this again. Let's draw around the image. Sorry, um, so Robbie, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean um, the, the sort of separation from the background tool, uh, which was done in photo. That was... Yes, that was. Well, let's just, just go back in it. Uh, let's go. Let's close this one down. Let's just undo that one. I didn't do it. Okay. Image cutout lab. By default, Rob, when you first go into it, you you've got the outline tool, the highlight tool. So it was in Photo Paint and Cutout Lab. Yeah. So here's let's go. Let's go. Eighty seconds. What I'm doing. So this is the highlighter. And that's where you go around the outside. And once you've gone all around the outside, you've got the paint bucket here to fill the bit you want to keep. And if you make any mistakes, like I did, you can also, also clean it up using, uh, using the eraser. So going back to the background, um, she doesn't really match color wise. So I'm just going to go into the um, image adjustment lab. And I'm just going to desaturate her a little bit. So you can see here, so I'm looking at the screen here and trying to match it up with this background, if you see what I mean. So I think that color fits it a lot better. You can always create a snapshot. Um, I'm just gonna say okay to that. So she now fits in with the background a lot better. But as I said, I just want to show you one more thing, which I forgot to show you. Um, let's just do this, just to, for the sake of speed. If I'd have said cut out as clip mask, let's just do this quickly. Instead of just cutting it out as I did before, if I said cut out as clip mask, if I now grab my paintbrush, and let's just make this a little bit. Bit bigger so we can see what we're doing. If I choose black, remember this is a clip, clip mask, I can paint with transparency. And if I click on white, I can paint the image back in again. And if I choose grayscale, I'm painting with semi transparency. So can't really see it, but it's semi-transparent. So saving it as a clip mask instead yeah, of just saying. Wait a minute, just a minute. It looks like the sound's gone. Uh, can you guys not hear anymore? Just better check. Just checking that you guys can hear or not. <laughs> uh, we're back at all yet. Okay. 
Ah, back again. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Might have just dropped out a second. Okay, basically, guys, what I said is, if instead of saying cut out, okay, if you say cut out as clip mask, you can use a paintbrush. And don't forget, you don't just have the standard paintbrush. You've got lots and lots of paintbrushes to choose from. You can just grab a paintbrush and using um, anywhere between the black and the white scale, you can paint with transparency or opacity. So you can further um, tweak any little mistakes that you have here. Okay, so that was the cut out there. Now we're almost finished here. If there's any of you out there that aren't yet using Coral Draw, but you might be thinking about it, we've got um, an enormous amount of people buying Coral Draw when, for example, Adobe switched to the subscription only model. Because with Coral Draw, we think you should have the choice as a customer. If you want to buy a DVD, you can buy a DVD. If you want to download it, fine. If you want to subscribe, fine. If you want to buy a license, fine. It's up to you. You can choose how you want to use this program. Because of that, we've got a lot of people coming in um, from Adobe and buying Coral Draw. Now, there isn't that much of a difference between the programs. Sometimes the things are just called a little bit different. So what's called an anchor point in Illustrator is called a node in Coral Draw. We've also got a workspace, which is very similar to the Adobe Illustrator workspace. If you want to know exactly what the differences are, or you need more help, go up to product help. Taking a second to load. There we go. Almost there. And if you click on reference, you've got Coral Draw for Adobe Illustrator users. And if you're in Photo Paint and you go to the same help page, you'll have Coral Draw for Photoshop users. And you've got compare the terminology, compare the tools, working with the, with the Illustrator workspace. So it's all very similar. So what I finally want to show you is, if you are really interested, if you think, yeah, I really do want to upgrade to this version, at the moment, we've got a fantastic cashback offer on. If you buy a full version, you, get, you can have up to £100 back, and there's £60 back for an upgrade version. You just have to make sure that you uh, go to this, this web link here, coraldraw.com slash cashback, and you just need to get your receipt or order invoice to us no later than 15th of December. Just in time for Christmas, you can have some money back. If you're interested in licenses, do contact my colleague here, Giovanni Raguzzo at coral.com, and he has to help you out with any license inquiries you might have. So if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, from my side, I've covered everything. If there are any topics you think, well, I'd really like to have a whole webinar about that, then perhaps let Joe know, and we're more than happy to set up another webinar um, homing in on specific topics for you. But I hope you found the, the webinar useful today, guys. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was brilliant. Um, I'm sure you guys agree there was a lot of content there that, that will be very useful to you. Uh, as you said, we have recorded this, but um, there's not a place for it to be watched back just yet. Um, keep, keep an eye and come back to us. It, it's in, in progress to build that. Um, but, but as Suzanne said, if you, if you do have um, additional content that you'd like to see, um, or if you've got a specific, yeah, another webinar that you'd like to see on a specific feature, or maybe one of the other parts of the Coral Draw package, um, yeah, just, just let us know. You can get in touch with myself. <clears throat> um, and yeah, if you are looking to, to up, upgrade to the latest version with some of those new features that, we, that, that, that were covered today, um, yeah, try and get in there maybe before the uh, 15th of December because you get that, that little bit of money back in your piggy bank to help you with Christmas. <laughs> but um, uh, someone has a little question there saying, when are we going to upload the video? As I said, we don't know yet because we're just working on building a section on our website, which is turning out to be a little trickier than we originally intended. So um, I, I can't tell you at the moment, but just um, uh, keep an eye and come back to us. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll probably do a bit of a, 
uh, a sort of press release or, or some information on our social media channels and things when that section is ready. So if you can just keep an eye out there. What I might try and do as well is send a little notification to anybody that's previously watched the webinar when that section is ready. So, so keep a bit of an eye out. But if anybody's got any quick questions, um, we, we, we've gone on for, for quite a while now. So if anybody's got any quick questions for Suzanne, we can probably cover those off. Um, <clears throat> if not, thanks for joining us again. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for future webinars. So,